Good afternoon and welcome to a special RCTV broadcast from the roof of Springford High School. Today, we're going to have a special program about the Great American Eclipse. I'm Mr. Landis. I'm Mr. Palmer. Welcome to the show. Before we get started, I want to warn everybody, please do not look at the sun. Mr. Palmer, I know you're prone to doing it, but what should we do instead? You need a set of these cool solar eclipse glasses. So if you did not get one of these, you cannot look at the sun. What's so good about these glasses, they block out the majority of the UV, the really harmful radiation from the sun, right? And they cut out all of the glare. Okay, so again, do not look at the sun without a pair of these cool glasses. These glasses, by the way, are 1,000 times darker than regular sunglasses. So don't think you can look at the sun using your sunglasses. I know there's some teachers here that may try to do that, and there might be some students. But remember, Spring Forward, glasses always. Put them on, turn, and stare at the sun. Safety guaranteed. Now. There's a lot of questions out there about what eclipses are. Sure are. So today we're going to answer those questions. We're going to find out about the cosmos and all the celestial energy that exists out there. So Mr. Palmer, what is an eclipse? So what an eclipse is in general is really just a shadow, right? So anytime we experience a sunny day, you can look on the ground and you see your shadow. An eclipse is really no different. Today we are just going to be basking in the shadow of the moon, right? So you may have heard all these terms, solar eclipse, lunar eclipse. What's the difference? So today we are experiencing a solar eclipse, right? Which means that the moon or the sun is casting a shadow over the moon, right? Blocking out the light, which we then get to experience. In other instances, you may hear of a lunar eclipse, which is actually the other way around, right? Where today is the moon is in between the sun and the earth. In a lunar eclipse, the moon's on the other side and we actually cast a shadow on the moon. Very interesting, Mr. Palmer. So we see the moon every day. We see it going around and around the Earth. Every 30 days, it circles around the Earth. How come we don't have multiple eclipses in a single year? So that's another great question. The reason we don't see an eclipse every month is because the plane of the moon's re re revolution around the Earth is not the same as the Earth's revolution around the sun. So it can get a little bit complicated, Mr. Landis, but if you can imagine a perfectly horizontal Earth revolving around the sun, and then you look at the moon orbiting the Earth, the moon kind of orbits diagonally. So it takes a really special day, a really special point in time for the, Earth's revo the moon's revolution around the Earth to match up with the Earth's revolution around the sun so they all form a perfectly straight line. Do you know what that line is called? When I do not. When things line up magically in the solar system. This is why you're the expert, Mr. Palmer. It's a really fun word to say. You ready? It's called syzygy. Syzygy. Syzygy is any time things in the solar system line up in a perfectly straight line. So today we have syzygy between the sun, the moon, and the Earth. Excellent. And wouldn't you say all the planets are on the same plane? Is that the, the same for, for everywhere around the universe in the solar system? They do. All the planets generally orbit in the same plane, so they kind of orbit around on, you can picture like a flat pancake is the solar system, right? But the moons, they're a little bit smaller than the planets, so they tend to kind of do their own thing. The moons kind of orbit in all sorts of funky directions for all the different, uh, all the different planets. Okay. Well, let's take a quick break and look at the sun. What can you tell us, Mr. Palmer, about... So we are looking here where the time is about 3.03. .03, so we are about 20 minutes away from what we will experience our maximum uh, solar eclipse. Uh, we unfortunately today are not in what's called the path of totality. So the sun will not completely be blocked by the moon. Uh, if we can get our cloud friends out of here today. Uh, the, most, the, uh, the maximum solar eclipse we will experience today is about 90%. Uh, so if you remember the last, do you remember when the last solar eclipse was? 2017. 2017. So for those of us that remember the solar eclipse in 2017, uh, around this area we experienced about 75% coverage of the sun, where today we're going to experience about 90%, so we're a little bit luckier. Today. That's pretty amazing. So what is unique about the Earth and the Moon? You know, I've heard all kinds of theories sure. about the Earth and the Moon. What's pretty special about it compared to the rest of the solar system? So we are super lucky on Earth to have the type of moon that we have, especially compared to the other planets in our solar system. When we look up in the sky, I'm sure we've all looked up at the moon, right? We tell you not to look up at the sun, but everyone maybe has done it at some time. We know that the moon and the sun are roughly the same size in the sky, right? And maybe we take that for granted. That is actually very, very rare in our solar system, right? Let's take Mars, for example. Mars is our, is our closest planetary neighbor, right? Some thousands of miles away. And Mars has two moons. Do you happen to know the name of Mars's two moons? I do. 
All as right. a history guy that studied Greek mythology, yeah. Phobos and Deimos. Phobos and Deimos are the names of Mars's moons. Now, in relation to our moons, Mars's moons are much, much smaller, which means when they experience a solar eclipse, they do not come anywhere close to blocking out the whole sun. Uh, a solar eclipse on Mars might just look like a little dot moving past, the, moving past the sun, where we get the experience of our moon blocking out the entire sun. If you go to other planets, the opposite might be true. You might have a moon that's way bigger than the sun, which might mean you get a full eclipse, but you don't get all the cool effects that we'll talk about later about our solar eclipse. Excellent, excellent. So what makes this one so special? What makes this eclipse especially uh, important is really the path that it's going to take. So the reason we call it the Great American Eclipse is because it's gonna start, uh, it actually started around one o'clock in the afternoon, uh, right around northern Mexico, and it just recently moved in through Texas, and it's gonna travel through tons of major American cities. It's gonna move in through San Antonio, uh, Houston, Dallas, all the way up through Indianapolis and Indiana. Uh, some people locally that might have traveled for the eclipse maybe went to Cleveland, Erie, Niagara Falls is gonna experience it. So there's so many people across North America that are gonna to get to see a total solar eclipse. Around the number, do you wanna take a guess? How many people? Oh, it's, you know, studying demographics myself, I would say it is 100 million people. Uh, well, it may, 30 million is the estimate for the amount of people that live in the area, but if you add in all the other people that are coming to join, who knows, maybe it might be 100. I know, I saw an interesting graphic that showed all the Airbnbs and all the hotels, and they were all booked across that path All booked of up, these people are. So how wide is that path of totality? The, the path of totality actually for this eclipse is pretty special. It's especially wide. It's about 100 miles, uh, which can sound pretty big on our scale, but it's a pretty small little sliver of the United States that gets to see it. But compared to the 2017 uh, eclipse, it's about twice as wide. So that's why we're, we're really, really lucky with this. So we're making a big deal about it. Making a big deal about it. It's science. We always got to make a big deal. About it. I know. So where are we at right now with this eclipse? So we are, let's look at if it again. If I stare oh. at it, I can stare at it directly without my glasses right now, kids, but I don't suggest you do that when the clouds are uncovering it. Right now, I cannot see a single speck of the sun, but Looking at our, at our time here, about 3.07, we're probably, if I had to estimate, about 70% 70 coverage in our way to 90%. Very good. So what would be some special opportunities that would take place during this eclipse? So our eclipse, again, only 90% coverage might not be as spectacular as those that are traveling to see the complete and total solar eclipse, but those folks get to see something really, really special. Uh, though we might not experience it, during a total solar eclipse, you'll see basically a 360 degree sunset. In the middle of the day, three o'clock in the afternoon, it's gonna look like darkness to these people, right? You're gonna talk about later, the animals start to do some weird things, right? Um, but it's gonna get really dark in the middle of nowhere. It's also gonna present an opportunity to see something about the sun that we almost never get to see, which is the sun's atmosphere. Mr. Landis, do you know what the name of the sun's atmosphere is? Enlighten us, Mr. Palmer. It's called the sun's corona. Okay, so the sun's corona is basically these really hot, highly energetic gases, right? Mostly made out of helium. Okay, fun fact, helium was actually discovered in the sun's corona during a solar eclipse. Um, and it really offers people an opportunity viewing the eclipse to see this atmosphere. Most of the time the sun is too bright and we don't get to see any of it. So it's a really, really special thing in that way. Uh, some other opportunities are gonna get to be, or are going to be to get to see some planets that we don't typically, uh, or, we, or we are not able to typically see. One of those is Venus. Right? So you're going to talk, what is, you talked earlier about Venus. What does Venus mean? What is the, the origin of the So Venus, again, name? all the planets in the solar system, they have ties to ancient Greek and ancient Roman cultures. Sure. So Venus, it means the beautiful one, like Aphrodite in Greece. Venus was, you know, the, the goddess of love for the Romans. Right. And am I also right, or maybe you can correct me, was she also the goddess of the sun, or was that somebody different? Well, That's probably somebody different. that is somebody different. Okay. So closely related. But the reason we're not able to typically uh, see Venus is because it orbits so close to the sun. But during a total solar eclipse, when we block out lots of the sun's light, it offers people an opportunity to see Venus so close to the sun that we're not typically able to see. Now, right now, you know, it is cloudy, but it seems like it's darker than it should be. Do you think that's partly because of this solar eclipse? Probably, right? Again, 90% of the sun's coverage... Uh, 90% of the sun being covered by the moon, I think we could safely say it's a little bit dimmer than it, than it usually is. So if the sun was out, what do you think that would look like? Uh, well, with all these clouds, who knows? But on a typical day, much brighter than it is. Right but now. I'm saying in a typical day, no clouds with the solar eclipse happening. Uh, 
What would it look like? From our perspective or yes. for a total perspective? from our perspective. From our perspective, uh, I'm not entirely sure what we would see exactly. We may, with 90% coverage, be able to see some of the sun's corona, this atmosphere that I was talking about. Uh, if we got really, really lucky, we may be able to see uh, Venus to the bottom right corner of the sun. Uh, but today with these clouds, I'm just not exactly sure what we're going to get to. You know, see. it's really interesting about perspectives. Sure. So as humans, if you would look at us on the camera, we wouldn't be able to tell this. But our rods and our cones in our eyes, as I've studied how we see things, because of the dimness, reds and greens would actually reverse in ah, our own perspective. I have heard that as well. I'm not, I, I'm not a color scientist. I don't know too much about the specifics on that one, but I have heard that people's perception of color can be a little bit skewed during a solar eclipse. It is, and that would be very interesting. So if you're at home, maybe put on a red shirt or a green shirt, and if that sun comes out, see if it changes your perception of your shirts. So these total eclipses won't happen forever. Correct. So we are in a really, really uh, a nice time to be a part of these solar eclipses. There will be a day long, long, long in the future where a total solar eclipse like today just won't occur anymore. That day is really, really far in the future. So I think we're going to be OK. But about 700 million years from now, the, the moon is going to slowly move away from the Earth and be far enough where it'll never be big enough in our sky to be able to cover up the entire Earth. So. We still have a few more to see, but so this is day. a special time to be alive. This is a special time to be alive absolutely. to see these solar eclipses. And what I've heard, it's centimeters each year, so, uh, about an inch and a half every year. So fun fact, it's about the, the rate at which your fingernails grow. The moon is slowly moving away from the Earth every year. Ah, so next solar eclipse, I'll be able to tell the difference. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Sure. Absolutely. So when's the next eclipse going to be? So today, you know, we're not having the luck with the sun being out. But what about the next one? There's obviously going to be many eclipses. You said they happen, but when's the next one here in the United States? So they do happen pretty often. On average, there's two to, between two and five solar eclipses on the Earth every given year, but only about one total solar eclipse every two years on average. So the next one that we're going to see anywhere uh, in the United States is going to be a little while. The next total solar eclipse in the United States is going to be in 2044, so 20 years from now. And you're going to have to travel pretty far to see that one. That one's going to be in the states of Montana, North Dakota, and South Dakota. The next one, you ready for this one? That's going to be anywhere near Warriors Ford, Pennsylvania. It is, it's in my notes here, in 2078 or somewhere around there in the late 2070s. So about 50 years from now, we're going to get to see a total solar eclipse again. Well, we'll actually be ready for this one in the path of totality. For oh, amazing. I'll be 101 years old. I'll yeah. still be in my prime. And we're going to be right here back on this roof looking at the solar. <laughs> Absolutely. That is so fun. Well, let's check it out. Again, we can't see it. Well, what do you think, Mr. Palmer? Where would we be? I think at this time, about 312, we would be getting about 80% coverage well on our way to 90%. And uh, looking at the sky, let's just hope some of these things pass over here in the next 10 It minutes. looks pretty dark right now, so pretty I'm not dark. sure if we're going to be able to see it. Kind of disappointing, but that's weather for you. You can never tell when it's going to rain, and you never tell when it's going to be yeah, sunny. unfortunately. So I got a joke for you, Mr. Palmer. Oh, give it to me. All right, so how does the moon cut its hair? The moon cut its hair, I don't know. It's eclipse a, it. Eclipse it. Oh, eclipse my it. gosh, eclipse it. <laughs> just for you guys at home. <laughs> Make sure you remember that one. Tell your family. So now that we've gone through the science, let's talk a little bit about history. Sure thing. You are the history guy of this, uh, of this broadcast. I'm I mean, excited to bring some historical knowledge to our viewers out there in the Spring Ford community. So for those that don't know, Mr. Landis is a history teacher here at the high school. All right. And the first thing I have to ask you is the perception of a solar eclipse, right? Kind of nowadays, our science has been so advanced, our computer programs, we know exactly when that sun's going to be covered down to the minute. Long time ago, one, two, three thousand years ago, that wasn't the case. How did, how did people in the ancient world perceive solar eclipses? So you have to remember, science in the most recent couple hundred years, we have developed techniques where we can predict where that sun's going to be, where the moon's going to be, when these eclipses are going to come through. Today, we can predict it down to the second. Sure. Thousands of years ago, they didn't know. Sometimes they would have seen one, and for them, it would have been complete confusion. That's where religion and science were kind of meshed together. So many of these ancient civilizations, they would believe the gods, hence the names of the planets named after different gods and goddesses. Mm -hmm. These gods controlled these heavenly bodies because to them it was unexplainable. They didn't know why the sun was getting dark. They had no understanding of this. So they became very, very superstitious. And many of them started to do a variety of different rituals 
and ceremonies to kind of prevent this from happening or to end it. Because to them, when the moon is covering the sun, it was the end of the world sure. for some of them. You know, darkness happens at night, not in the middle of the day. So what were they going to do? Some of them did some crazy, crazy rituals. Yeah, I can imagine. The sun was such a big part of their lives, right? Like they, they relied on the sun to tell them when to wake up, when to go to sleep. The sun was responsible for growing their crops, right? Keeping them warm. And if the sun went away, I can imagine the panic. That was Everything. And for many of these see. civilizations, the sun was their supreme deity. Sure. In Egypt, Ra, it was the sun god. With the Mayans and the Aztecs and the Incas, the sun played such a pivotal role in their civilizations. And when it disappeared, the world was ending to them. Yeah. So I know there's another, um, is there a Chinese connection with eclipse? Where does the word eclipse come from? So there is. Eclipse actually in Chinese means to eat or to eat the sun. In this case, they believed in a huge dragon that would devour the sun. And their response to that was to scare that dragon away. Now, how would you scare a dragon away? Oh, gosh, I don't know if I'm brave enough to scare a dragon away, <laughs> to be honest with you. I'd probably so, freeze in So freeze just, think, in just think about a bear. What if a bear comes in your vicinity? What are you gonna do? Uh, aren't you supposed to make yourself all big and scary? In yeah, big and scary, make some loud noises. That's what the Chinese did. They would bang on drums and, and make as much noise and clamor as possible. And then when they would see the sun starting to emerge, they believed that it worked. And that perpetuated over centuries. In fact, in recent history, the Chinese have even fired off cannons you know, during an eclipse to scare that dragon away. Wow. So these eclipses, you know, it, it's not something that happened thousands of years ago. We can see some of these rituals and ceremonies even into the recent days. Sure, sure. Is there also a connection in Mayan civilization? Something about human sacrifices? Oh, yes. Yeah. So if we get into the Americas, you know, very, very interesting. So we have the three ancient civilizations in the Americas, the Aztecs, the Incas, and the Mayans. And all three had rituals and ceremonies when the sun started to become eclipsed by the moon. Some of them were bloodletting ceremonies where kings and queens of these ceremonies, of these uh, civilizations would let their blood out on the straw in hopes that it would appease the gods. Others, like the Incas, would sacrifice some of their individuals, whether it's peasants or whether it was prisoners of war, at the height of the eclipse, you know, murdering these citizens. And then when they would see the sun start to emerge again, it worked. So every time there was a solar eclipse, you could expect those kinds of uh, awful, awful ceremonies and rituals. Pretty different than we experience them now, right? Absolutely. You know, I don't think I see anybody out here doing any human sacrifice, and I'm glad for that, Mr. Palmer. Correct. We are in the day of science now. We use solar eclipses much more now to, to view the sun in ways that we don't typically get to view it and try to find some things out scientifically. And, that, and that's what I love. History and science can meld. Oh, absolutely. What about the history of science, Mr. Palmer? What can you tell us about that? So two, and I kind of already made mention to one here, two major discoveries that have occurred during solar eclipses. First is the discovery of helium, as I mentioned earlier. So helium was actually, uh, if you've learned anything about the periodic table, the first element ever discovered extraterrestrially, which means not on planet Earth. We found it before before we ever found it anywhere on our own planet, we found it in the sun's corona, okay? So through a kind of a fancy process called spectroscopy, which is, you ever play with a prism? Absolutely. A triangular prism? They held a prism up to, up to the sun, they let light travel through the prism. Do you know what happens to light it in, when it goes into a prism? It divides into the different colors. It divides into the different colors of a rainbow. And uh, scientists have gotten really, really good at analyzing that rainbow that gets split up from the sun's light. And through that, they're able to kind of decipher what elements or uh, what type of chemicals and molecules make up the light that's being produced. And they determined that helium, uh, which at the time was an unknown element, was actually a part of the sun's corona. Uh, so that was kind of major discovery number one. Fast forward about 100 years and you get to the theories about from Albert Einstein. You know who Albert Einstein is? Absolutely. Theory of relativity. Theory. One of the smartest guys this world's ever seen. Smartest guys. He and just what, didn't use a comb though. That's the only problem. Uh, true. Yes. His hair was kind of funky <laughs> and wild. Uh, what's actually really interesting about Albert Einstein is we view him now as this super, super smart guy that never, that really everything he ever said came true. He wasn't always viewed that way. He was viewed as a really smart guy, but he had some crazy wacky theories that at the time might not have necessarily been able to be confirmed. We're now about a hundred years after that. Basically, everything Albert Einstein's ever said has come to be true. Referring to solar eclipses, Albert Einstein came up with what you said, the theory of general relativity, which basically means that things in outer space that are really big and massive can bend space, which means if you're traveling in a straight line and you come near something big and massive like a star, 
your path, though it may seem like a straight line, actually starts to bend. So the big discovery that we made and big confirmation we made during a solar eclipse that had far fewer, far fewer clouds than this one was we were actually able to observe a star that was behind the sun. So imagine if my clipboard here is the sun and my fist is a star, you're not typically able to see that star, right? But Einstein's theory of general relativity says the, the light that's going to shine out in the other direction is actually going to be curved by the sun and us here on Earth are able to observe it. This was, though fairly complicated, one of the most massive confirmations of how we view our fundamental reality here on Earth. And it is, uh, as a physics teacher, one of the most interesting things I can possibly think of about our solar. Well, those guys are way smarter than me, so I'm glad they figured it out. Oh, I yeah. didn't have to We just ride on the, that's why the, the, the term, uh, what are the, stepping on the shoulders of giants, right, or walking on the shoulders of giants, we have these smart guys to... That is very true. Forward. And I will tell you, if we even look at science and understanding the phases of the moon, we can go even further back. Have you ever heard of Stonehenge? I have. In England, right? Yes, yeah. it is in England. Yes. So, you know, we have this ancient megalith where there are these massive stones that are arrayed in a circle and they're all piled on top of each other. And, and many of the questions were, why do these exist? But today, after doing, you know, study after study after study with these stones, we can tell that most likely... They were done to record the phases of the sun and the moon and possibly even solar eclipses. And this was 2,500 years ago. Oh, yeah. It's Lots absolutely... of questions. First, how did they get those stones like that? And then how did they do the mathematical computations? It's absolutely amazing oh, to yeah. think that absolutely. solar eclipses have had that effect on our world. And even today, we can still see it. And kind of going again with the fusion of history and science, kind of uh, pinpointing dates in history, one of the ways that I've learned that they can do that is through solar eclipses. For example, if, you have, if we have ancient texts that we're trying to read and analyze from 2,000 years ago, and if they make mention of a solar eclipse, we can do a nice job of placing that on the timeline of history exactly where they are, where we might not have been able to do that otherwise. No, that's fantastic. So where are we at, Mr. Palmer? What time are we at right now? We are at 322. So if we, uh, if we didn't have overcast skies here, we would bat, we'd be at about our maximum solar eclipse. We can, uh, we can throw our glasses on here and try to take a look, but... I don't even know where the sun is in the sky <laughs> right now, Mr. Palmer. I don't think we're going to have too much luck. But <laughs> So right about now, uh, the sun, or I'm sorry, the moon is covering up about 90% of the sun. Right, and now it's going to start to, right after about a minute from now, start to kind of move away. But we still, if we can get the clouds out of here, still have about an hour of, uh, of some type of eclipse before it completely passes by. Now again, I know there's some dark clouds, but it does seem darker. So I feel like we are seeing a little bit of the effect, even though we have these cloud covers right now. I'd like to think so, yeah. Sorry, it's kind of hard to tell with these clouds. But I think, I think definitely we have, I mean, we have less light hitting the hitting the earth than we normally would, about yes. 90% less, sure. So let me talk about some other historical events associated with eclipses. Sure. So there's been lunar eclipses and solar eclipses throughout history. Many times, you know, these people didn't know that they were going to happen. Other times they predicted when it was going to happen. Mm -hmm. But before those ages, when we knew when solar eclipses were going to happen, many times they were associated with major historical events. You know, in, in Europe, we had the death of King Henry IV, and we had the death of Louis Martel of the Holy Roman Empire. Is and he the Sun King? He was he the not sun? the Sun ah, King. Sorry, we'll I'll get talk to the about him king. in a sorry, moment. Sorry, I got excited. But Louis Martel of the Holy Roman Empire, when he died, both of those, England and in the Holy Roman Empire, it was thrown into chaos. And they attribute that death partly to the solar eclipse. Uh -huh. Again, religious superstition. You know, did the sun play a part in the deaths of these two prominent men? So we've had solar eclipses around World War I, one of the most devastating wars the world has ever seen. Solar eclipse right near the beginning of that war. So we can see solar eclipses have had an effect on the history of people. It makes people do crazy things too. Sure, yeah. You know, we can see, you were talking about in totality where you can see, you know, 360 degrees, it looks like the sunrise. People start to do crazy things during a uh, atmospheric change like that. The weather begins to change, the light begins to change. It's just like in the full moon. I think people start to get strange as well. Uh, that's what they say. I don't know. I don't know. I got to look into that one a little bit more. But that is one of the questions that was asked by one of our viewers. What changes during a solar eclipse? We talked about perception. The weather does get a little bit 
cooler. Yes. So we're not getting the I think the we heat. can feel it right now. It, I, it, we it's absolutely not the clouds, feel it. We definitely feel it right now. It's getting a little bit chillier up here. So it, it's really cool just to see or feel these effects even though we have this cloud cover. Yes. Now, I want to... Do we want to move to the animal stuff now? Or are you ready to... Do you have any more history you want to talk about? So right now, I want to talk about prophecies. Prophecies. Oh, let's get the prophecies. Give, okay. give me all your, all your predictions about the future. So, so that's the thing. With prophecies... You have to be aware. Some people have some crazy ideas out there when it comes to prophecies. I was told the other day that possibly your brain would melt from the rays of the solar eclipse. Is that why I'm we're not, wearing I'm the hats? I'm not taking any chances, Mr. Palmer. That's why we're wearing the yes, hats. Yes, that's okay. why I'm wearing the hat okay. right now. I'm just taking your if word it, for it. If it can block point. those dangerous rays, I'm all for it. Good. Safety. And like even, the glasses. That's right. Just like the glasses. So protect yourselves out there, kids, just in case you believe that. I, for one, don't believe it, but I'm not taking any chances. Oh, uh, absolutely. You can't. You I can't. know Mr. Leopold, our geology teacher here, told me to do it. Don't take those chances. So I trust in his judgment. He's one of those giants that were standing on his shoulders. Oh, absolutely. For sure. So for sure. other prophecies around the world, you know, whether it's civilizations or religions, they all have some mode of this is going to happen in the future when a solar eclipse happens. Is there any credence to that? I don't do. I don't believe that. But who knows? Maybe there will be. It starts, as you talk about history, it starts to make a lot of sense. When people, when you don't have a great understanding of what's happening, it can be, it can cause you to do some crazy things. And now when we start to understand that this is an astronomical event that really occurs pretty regularly, we can, we can start to make some more rational decisions. I like to think of myself as a rational person. I but again, that. not taking any chances. Says the guy with the tinfoil hat. <laughs> so let's talk about some other things. I know a lot of people had questions about their pets and animals around the world. So at the height of a solar eclipse, I know people do some strange things, yes. oohs and ahs and put tinfoil hats on, but what about the animals? The animals have no idea that a solar eclipse is going to happen. So at the height of the solar eclipse, what do some of these animals do? So give me an animal. A, give me the deer that we see all over. Okay, all so, over so many of the bovine, the deer type animals, the horses, they start to, to whinny and, and shake their heads and move their tails and jump around because it's just very different for them. Uh, you have your dogs at home. Dogs get very anxious, which by the way, I should have mentioned this earlier in the warning, don't let your pets outside during the solar eclipse because what will happen is they'll look directly at the sun. They'll think it's nighttime and cause some damage to their eyes, but they get very anxious. Birds, they believe it's nighttime. They start to do their night songs and their night calls and they roost in the trees. Bees, as a beekeeper, I've witnessed the, uh, the activity of bees and at the height of a solar eclipse, in totality, they'll stop because they think it's nighttime. They don't want to get lost or they'll pick up their activity like they have to get it done and get back to their hive before totality ends. In zoos, flamingos protect their young. Giraffes run around in circles. The bears think it's time to hibernate and just take a nap in the middle of the day. So that's something I think I, we should do also. Ah, hey, <laughs> if you're giving me extra nap time, I'm never gonna say no. I'm never gonna say no. So, that's really, that's really, really like very interesting. How, and, and when the sun comes back out, things just go back to normal. Go back to normal. Yeah. So it, it, it's definitely interesting, and I know they're doing study after study with animals, and I'm sure they're out there today studying what these animals are doing during totality. And, yeah, and it's a great way to bring that up. As, as much as we think of today, for people like us, just to kind of ooh and ah at the solar eclipse, and we're lucky enough to get to talk about it, there's real science and, I'm sure, some history, but real science being done on these days, whether it be animals or looking at the sun or things you can see around the sun. Lots of, lots of real stuff going on. Today. We can, Absolutely. Uh, it looks like the sun's <laughs> just starting to come out again soon, right at the end of the eclipse, but that's the way life goes sometimes. We don't get everything we always want. So looking at a couple questions, I know we have a minute or two left here before the end of our show, but there were some interesting viewer questions. One of those was uh, about Louis XIV. So being a history guy, he was known as the Sun King. There's the Sun King. How would sun he feel King. about solar eclipses? And from my judgment, being one, uh, a guy that just was interested in unlimited power, he wouldn't think too highly of solar eclipses mm. or something dimming his... Uh, his bright rain, That's right. right. Yes. That's right. Absolutely in France. Well, everybody, 
We want to thank you for tuning in to RCTV today for our special Great American Eclipse show. It's been an awesome time up here with Mr. Palmer on the yeah. roof of Springford High School. We hope you learned some interesting facts. And, and then, if we take a look, this sun. I think sun, it's coming right back out. I can actually look at it with the clouds over it. We can start. I think any minute now we're going to get to see some. Uh, we're going to get to see some sun. So if you have your glasses, make sure you step outside. Check out this event because it's going to be a long time before we see it again in this part of the country.